Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Klingberg Wing Mark II Development. I'm Raul Klingberg, your host. The purpose of this video is to introduce the various materials and construction methods uh, that I intend to use for my new rigid wing hang glider. Uh, this video shows various components uh, that I produced for testing purposes. None of these components are flight quality, uh, but you might learn a thing or two along the way. Um, it does show uh, the various uh, methods I intend to use to produce the final aircraft. Uh, so th this video is really just for demonstrative purposes, and I hope you learned something along the way. So let's get started. The first picture shows a typical spar shear web. One end is designed to extend beyond the root of the wing for attachment purposes. Several shear web designs have been built and tested as part of this project. This one consists of a half inch thick core of divinacell foam with one layer of 5.6 ounce carbon fiber cloth on the front and aft face. The root fitting has 1 8 inch thick carbon fiber plates on each side of the spar under the face sheets that cover the remainder of the spar. The root core is plywood with phenolic bushings for the attachment bolts. In this photo, I'm showing an L-shaped flange made of one layer of 5.6 ounce carbon fiber cloth. Four of these flanges are bonded to the shear web to provide a surface for attaching the D-tube and aft wing skins. Also shown is a piece of 1x2 lumber, which, have, uh, which I've covered with packing tape. This item is used to clamp the flange tightly to the shear web while the epoxy cures. I use T88 epoxy for this type of secondary bond. It has a shear strength of about 2800 PSI for these types of materials. There are other epoxies that have shear strengths up to 4500 PSI, but they are very expensive and that level of bond strength is not needed for this type of joint. This photo shows how I produced the shear web flanges. I used standard aluminum angle brackets placed on a section of plastic countertop material. The carbon fiber fabric is wider than the angle brackets and the excess is trimmed off post cure before the part is removed from the mold. I used narrow 3 inch wide woven edge carbon fiber fabric uh, so I didn't have to cut long strips and the edges don't fray during the wet out process. Also it's important to use uh, peel ply on both sides of this layup. Uh, so that it has the proper surfaces for bonding on additional parts later in the assembly process. In this photo we see the flanges being bonded to the shear web. I applied a thin layer of T88 adhesive to both the flange and the shear web. I used painter's tape on the shear web to ensure epoxy is applied only where needed. Given that 50% of the weight of composite aircraft structures is adhesives, it is important to use only just as much as needed to bond the parts. I used a couple of 1x2s and clamps to hold the flanges in place while the epoxy cured. I applied these flanges in two steps. In this shot we see the hands of my wonderful daughter applying structural filler, shredded cotton and epoxy, which is called phlox, to any gaps between the flanges and the shear web. This is done prior to laying up the cap strips and ensures that there are no voids between the spar cap and the shear web. You can also see a section of the spar cloth, which is unidirectional carbon fiber. You can purchase these materials in a variety of widths at a good price from Solar Composites at the link shown here. You can see the entire spar cap build process in another video on my channel. The next phase of this process is attachment of the aft ribs and rear spar. The construction of the rear spar is detailed in another video on this channel. For the root and tip ribs, and any other highly loaded area, I use ribs that are 8 inch thick, 3 pound per cubic foot divinacell with face sheets of 2.5 ounce carbon fiber cloth, one layer on each side. I make large sheets of this material and simply cut out the ribs using a box cutter knife. A new carbide blade works best. These parts are assembled using T88 epoxy and cotton fiber flox. Normally these parts would be assembled jigged up on a flat table to ensure proper washout and alignment. But this section is for structural tests only, so I simply eyeballed the alignment. Here you can see that I have clamped an aluminum angle bracket, same one I used to make the shear web flanges, to the rear spar to ensure it stays straight while I install the remaining aft ribs. To position the remaining ribs, I apply painter's tape to the top and bottom of both spars and mark the rib positions. This photo shows the rib blanks epoxied in place 
and the tape removed. The ribs simply are quarter inch thick, six pound per cubic foot divinacell foam. You can also see small strips of foam I added to each side of the rib blanks to stiffen them sufficiently so they don't break before the wing skins are applied. Finally, you can note that the ribs are just rectangular blanks. My plan was to apply Teflon tape to the root and tip ribs and simply hot wire the foam ribs to shape, thus ensuring linear alignment. However, I was unaware of the high heat required to melt this foam and my standard hot wire could not do the job. I also have read some opinions that this foam generates harmful gases when melted, so I decided to punt and make paper templates and cut the foam with a razor blade. The final process for shaping the ribs is to be determined. Next up is the assembly of the nose ribs and the leading edge tube. This tube is used to transfer the loads from the D tube into the root structure of the wing and thus distribute the torsional loads. The tube is made of biaxial woven tubular carbon fiber cloth. The cloth is available from a variety of sources, quite easy to use. This tube is five layers thick at the root and tapers to one layer thick at the tip. The total length of the tube is approximately four feet. Please subscribe and you'll receive notice when I post an upcoming video on how to produce this type of tubing. At this point in the assembly, I have taped the nose ribs in place and bonded the leading edge tube to the nose ribs. The nose ribs are made from the same materials as the aft ribs at the root and tip. At the root end of the leading edge tube, I installed a short section of aluminum tubing that serves to align the wing to the root structure and transfer the torsion loads. This aluminum tube is filled with a wood dowel to prevent crushing of the tube and is then bonded and riveted into the carbon fiber tube. To avoid galvanic corrosion of the tube, it is necessary to use stainless steel rivets and have a layer of fiberglass on the inside of the carbon fiber tube to prevent direct contact between the carbon fiber and the aluminum. Now, we are moving on to the construction of the mold used to produce the D-tube for the leading edge. To keep the mold simple and low cost, I hotwired the shape out of blue foam, two pound per cubic foot material. This material had some problems due to variations in density within the block causing variances in the shape that had to be filled and sanded later. In the future, I plan on using expanded polystyrene bead foam block, which I know have very consistent density. For templates, I use eighth inch thick press board with Teflon tape applied to the edges so that the hot wire runs smoothly. I epoxy the templates to the foam so they don't move. Once the mold was cut, I filled any low spots with feather light drywall filler and sanded smoothed the shape using a long straight edge 1x2 with 80 grit sandpaper attached. The ends of this bar don't have sandpaper so they can run on the templates without sanding the templates themselves. I used the cradles from the original cutting process to support the mold during any of these final shaping processes. To help protect the mold from any dents during usage, I cover it with something durable and easy to repair. I've used packing tape, duct tape, and poster board. I like the poster board best. By joining sheets of poster board together with masking tape and then gluing the large sheet to the foam core with epoxy, a strong durable mold is produced for reasonable cost. I've tried covering the entire mold with packing tape, but it's not really necessary as a layer of mylar protects it during the layout process. Finally, you may wish to note the marks on the mold. These marks are on the 45 degree bias and are placed to prep represent where the carbon fiber cloth will be applied. One mark is at the end of where the cloth will lie and the second is two inches inboard to represent the amount of overlap that is needed from one piece of cloth to the next. By laying the carbon fiber cloth on the bias, the toes that make up the fabric are aligned with the torsional load in the wing and thereby are able to help carry a higher load. This picture shows how I lay out the fabric for the inside of the D-tube. It is two and a half ounce carbon fiber with Kevlar tracers. I like the tracers as they help with alignment of the cloth. However, they can be a problem if one has to sand an edge later in the process. After sanding, all the little Kevlar fibers that refuse to be sanded have to be cut off with a razor blade. In the photo, you can see how I like to tape down the edge of the cloth so it stays properly aligned while I lay out the painter's tape and cut the piece of fabric. In this photo, I'm showing the final D-tube in place on the spar. 
The first check fit is used to find the location of the center line of the spar relative to the D-tube. The D-tube is marked with this line and then removed and trimmed to final size. I'm sorry to say that there are no photos or videos of this molding process. Um, the process is quite uh, involved and keeps three or four people busy, and we just didn't have the bandwidth uh, to record that process. Uh, recently, I did a small D-tube sample of just the leaning edge. Uh, that's online. If you look around my channel, you'll find it, and that shows the basic process of the layup on the mold. Um, also, take a look at the uh, structural concepts video and uh, you'll see, get a little more information on how I do that molding process. So uh, peruse my site and take a look and uh, in the future I will have uh, a video posted that shows the entire D2 molding process. The next segment of photos show how the D2 internal structure is installed and the final assembly attached to the spar. In this shot, the internal structure has been cleaned of any oils using alcohol, and then I've applied T88 epoxy with cotton fiber flux adhesive to the leading edge tube. There's no adhesive on the ribs at this time. In the next photo, you can see I've applied the same adhesive to the inside of the D-tube where the leading edge tube will rest. Next, the nose rib and tube assembly is placed inside the D-tube and carefully aligned. At this point, one can either wait until the adhesive is cured or, if using great care, move ahead with gluing the ribs in place. The ribs are secured with the same adhesive by forming fillets of the adhesive as shown. Please note that the rib adhesive stops short of, of the back end of the nose rib. This area has to be left open so that the flange and spar cap can slip in between the rib and the D-tube. After the assembly was cured, I attached flanges to the aft end of each nose rib. These are one inch wide carbon fiber flanges bonded on with straight T88 epoxy. No cotton fiber flux used for this bond. After a final check fit, I clean the main spar and apply T88 epoxy with cotton flux to all the mating surfaces. I start the process with the rib flanges that mate to the main spar shear web. You can see I have used a generous amount of adhesive to ensure any gaps between the rib and the spar will be filled. Given that this final assembly is done blind, one has to be very careful to ensure that there are no voids between any of the mating parts. After it is assembled, there is no way to go back and fix any errors. This is a process that must be done correctly on the first pass. When I apply adhesive to the main spar caps, I mask off the rear half of the spar so the surface remains clean for later bonding of the aft wing skins. The next two photos show the D-tube assembly in place on the main spar. I use duct tape to initially align and secure the assembly. Once it is in the proper position, I apply padded 1x2s on the top and bottom of the wing. I hold them in temporary position with tape and then apply clamps and firmly secure the D-tube to the spar caps. Then I walk away so I don't mess up a good job by playing with my new toy. The final series of photos shows construction and installation of the aft wing skin. For the aft wing skins, I used 1 8 inch thick 3 pound per cubic foot divinacell with 1.8 ounce Kevlar for the outer skin and scrim cloth on the inside. I have since switched to fiberglass on the outer surface for a variety of reasons that you can hear about in my video on wing skin studies. Go take a look. The first photo shows cutting the Kevlar to shape. You can see that the Kevlar is not laid on the bias. Given that the aft skins are not intended to carry any significant loads, the cloth can be laid axially and thereby reduce material wastage. This photo shows the interior surface with the scrim cloth in place. This cloth is often used as reinforcement in sails for boats and hang gliders. The diagonal black fibers are actually Kevlar and they are held together by a quarter inch grid of fine fiberglass fibers. You can get this cloth from the link shown above. This shot shows how I glued a small stick of spruce to the trailing edge of the wing skin. Uh, this provides a rigid closed finish at the aft end of the wing where the flap system will be attached. Once again, there are no photos of the actual molding process, but I will have one in the near future. 
The basic process involves placing a thick sheet, say 10 mil thick, layer of mylar or polyester plastic on a smooth building surface. Mold release is applied, and then it is sprayed with epoxy paint that forms the outer surface of the wing. After the paint is dry to the touch, the fiberglass is then placed on the sheet and wet out with laminating resin, and the foam core is placed on top. The scrim cloth is rolled up and wet out with epoxy on a scrap sheet of plastic. By doing it this way, any excess epoxy is left behind. The scrim is then rolled onto the foam core, and the entire assembly is vacuum bagged to the building table. Once cured, the paint is molded into the outer surface and the mylar can be easily removed. The final part will have a near mirror finish provided you started with a very smooth table. When the aft wing skins are complete, they can be attached to the aft wing structure. I start the process by doing a test fit and using a marker to indicate where the ribs will touch the skin. To size the wing skin, I tape it to the rear spar and then apply painter's tape to the front of the wing skin and flex it down to the D-tube. Once in place, the aft skin can be marked where the D-tube ends. Then I remove the wing skin, trim it to size using a long straight edge and a box knife cutter. To bond the wing skin in place, I apply T88 epoxy and cotton flox adhesive to the rear and main spars. I use painter's tape on the D-tube to ensure no adhesive gets on that beautiful outer finish. Next, I apply duct tape to the inside of the wing skin to create a place for the adhesive that will bond the skin to the ribs. I use duct tape so that the adhesive will be fairly thick to make up for any variances in the rib shape. I make the width of the adhesive area fairly wide, about an inch or so. This allows for variances in final placement. Next, I mix up a fairly thick mixture of laminating epoxy resin and microballoons and apply this adhesive to the inner surface of the wing skin. When I'm done, I remove the duct tape. After the mixture of epoxy resin and microballoons is applied to the wing skin, I apply the same mixture uh, to the top of each rib. Uh, this ensures that there will be sufficient adhesive between the wing skin and the ribs to get a consistent bond everywhere. Once I have the wing skin in place, I securely attach the trailing edge to the rear spar and flex the front of the skin down tight to the main spar, making sure the gap between the aft skin and the D-tube is as small as possible. I then secure it with a little duct tape. Once I have the wing assembly on a nicely padded surface, I don't want to damage any final finishes, I place one by two over the joint and apply weights to the board. This ensures that the aft wing skin will be tightly bonded to the main spar. After I have the area properly masked off, I fill any gaps in the seam uh, between the uh, D-tube and the aft skins with a thick mixture of microballoons and epoxy. Once it is cured, I carefully sand it to the final height using the tape as a guide uh, so that I don't sand into the surface of the D-tube or the rear skin. For a finer finish, this joint can then be wet sanded. To finish the wing, I simply apply white vinyl tape to the seam. Uh, it is my intent that the tape be replaced yearly or on an as-needed basis. This process is then repeated for the opposite uh, aft wing skin, and once that's done, the wing section is completed. In the final photos, you can see the completed wing section. Uh, this section is not representative of what the final aircraft will be uh, as to configuration, but it is representative of the materials uh, being used and uh, served well to uh, test those materials as well as the wing joiner. Uh, you'll note that there's no sweep built into the wing as that is not uh, critical at this stage of testing. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and learned something along the way. I learned a ton when I was building this thing, and uh, there are going to be many changes going into the final configuration based on what I learned from these tests. So stick with me, follow along, and enjoy the development of this new hang glider. See you next time.